Hello, I am Dr. Smarty Pants, uh, and I am joined today, I'm honored to be joined today by my dear friend, Sister Catherine, Mother Superior of the Order of Roman Catholics. So, <laughs> we want to talk to you today about the danger of religious uniforms. So, thought uh, we should wear some religious uniforms. I got to take these dumb little glasses off. I can't see a thing with them things. <laughs> For the greater glory of God. Yeah, there you go. You feel holier now that you heard that, don't you? <laughs> uh, just, you know, we're showing you the absurdity of religious uniforms. But you can turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 23. And we're going to read here. Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 12. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. They're in the Old Testament, in other words. Most of the book of Matthew is written in the Old Testament. Verse 3, All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men, they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. Hello? You know? Religious uniforms. And love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be, ye not, but be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Okay, uh, now this ridiculous get up here that I have on, this is a actual real PhD robe. And uh, of course, Sister Catherine here, she has her special outfit on as well. For the greater glory of God. Yeah. She is getting into the, her nun act here. Her militant, you know, Catholic nun act. Right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the thing that we're seeing here is the fact that people will wear robes uh, to exalt themselves. Now, if I showed up at some seminary somewhere dressed in this ridiculous getup, uh, would people treat me differently? Yes, they would. If she showed up like this, would people treat, treat her differently? Of course. I yeah. hope so. Yeah. <laughs> because after all, I am a good person. Why would you judge me for how I look? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. See? It's important, isn't it? But, you know, as we've been doing this study on the Amish cult, um, you know, we see this thing of this religious uniform. And they will actually say, and if you've seen some of the Amish exposed videos, they actually do teach that you can tell if somebody's saved or lost by what they're wearing, by their clothes. It's absolutely as ridiculous. As long as they don't have any wrinkles in their clothes. Yeah. You cannot get to heaven if you have wrinkles in your clothes. Mm-hmm. After all, we live for the greater glory of God. <laughs> I'm sorry, did I say that? Yes, sister, you're getting quite <gasps> militant. <gasps> Do some penance or something like that, okay? Do some prayers or you don't have your rosary. What are you going to do? Oh, I think I lost my salvation. What am I going to do? Oh, oh, what if Father I have quite, finds out? I have quite the actress here. But anyhow, let's continue. Jump down to verse 27 there in uh, chapter 23. One to, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. And of course, you know, you get these Catholics and things, and you get people dressed in this r ridiculous kind of nonsense. And outwardly they will appear very righteous. You know, like I said, we go anywhere near any kind of religious righteous things. People think we're great and everything for wearing this type of stuff. But inwardly, the people that are full or that are that are wearing these things, they're full of dead men's bones. They're very, very wicked. 
and that's why we're making fun of this whole system okay it's quite disgusting but next 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 let's go to Luke chapter 20 Luke chapter 20 verse uh, 45 through 47 Okay, it says here, Then in the audience of all the, the people, he said unto his disciples, Beware of the scribes, kind of like Bible scholars of today, which desire to walk in long robes and love greetings in the markets and the highest seats in the synagogues and the chief rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses and for a show make long prayers. The, sh the same shall receive greater damnation. Uh, when you start to get that thing of this outward self-righteousness, this outward religious uniform type of nonsense, you actually receive to yourself greater damnation. You say, well, how can you, you know, if you're going to hell and this person's going to hell, how can there be such a thing as greater damnation? Well, very simple. Because greater damnation means you have less of a chance to get saved. When you start to have your outward righteousness, and I've been dealing with this thing a lot. I mean, if you want to get some some good little jabs in, if you want to witness to some lost people, go on over to the Hellish Hutterite video uh, there on the main channel, the Husky 394 XP channel. And there are Hutterites that are coming along and they're, they're you know, attacking me and saying all this other stuff. Write to them and tell them that they're lost. Okay? Uh, witness to them. Those people are very, very lost. Why? They're counting on their outward standards. They're counting on their religious community life and all that other stuff. It's sad, really. It really is. You know, people mistake my um, my sarcasm for not being loving. Quite on the contrary. I'm sarcastic because I am loving. Okay, I make fun of systems that are wicked and systems that are evil. I mean, that's what we're doing today. You know, we're just trying to have some fun here and, you know, just show the ridiculousness of this whole system, of this outward adorning. I mean, what does this mean? Oh, look at me. I have a PhD robe on. Wow, I feel smarter already. I mean, give me a break. And of course, you know, a lot of these PhDs that I've met, you know, especially those that don't hold to the King James Bible, they'll use it but not, not believe it, you know. Um, a lot of those people are some of the most wicked out there. I mean, I've told stories about that. Some of these PhDs I've met, they, and they don't know the Bible. That's the funny thing. And they do it to find God in all things. Yeah. Yeah, they'll say that. So, but we're going to look at some r pictures of religious uniforms, okay? Now, remember, the Amish and the Mennonites and the Hutterites and the Bruderhof, and there's a, there's a bunch of others, too, that we found out. The Quakers is another group. Um, there's a bunch of these. Their claim is that they are Anabaptist, that they're not Catholic, okay? So, we're going to look at some of this stuff. I'm going to show you, we're going to look at some really wild pictures here comparing nuns, like our good friend, Sister Catherine here. Comparing Mother Superior the, Catherine. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to... Why would you degrade my title? Hey, I'm a PhD. You be quiet. Yes, so, and you work with us. I'm a scholar. Us. I'm a scholar. Shh. Don't bite the hand that feeds you. Uh-huh. I can remove you from your position there, scholar. Uh-huh. We'll see about that later. But, uh... Sorry, we're having some uh, educational differences here and, and you know... She's challenging my title. We'll see about that in a bit. But um, <laughs> anyhow, uh, we're going to see some of the tie-ins here. And we're going to see that the Amish uniforms are not really that different from uh, Catholic nuns here. Let's look at some of these. Okay, first of all, you have a typical picture of nuns here. These are Augustinian nuns. And they got the little wreath of flowers on their heads meaning that they're that's what the marriage ceremony or something that they go through you know part of the initiation yeah and uh i guess we'll just go through them this way and what is this now a muslim that is a young muslim woman yeah we have praying. a young young muslim woman here praying and uh you know very similar kind of a covering up top here and covering down along here but you know? her her distinctive christian veiling has has patterns on it she can't get to heaven looking like that yeah it's terrible isn't she it? has to have a plain head covering i mean i'm sorry christian veiling uh-huh and then here we have uh roman catholic nuns again this is if you remember seeing pictures of mother Teresa, uh you'll you know this is the kind of stuff that she wears they're copying and, me again 
Yep. Why are they wearing a different color than me? So, and look what we have here. Old Order Mennonites. Hmm. Uh, very similar in many ways. And you'll see here in just a little bit about some of this thing of the nuns' habit, where they certain nuns, certain orders in the nuns, they'll wear these, like, uh, kind of a, what would you call that? The bodice piece or whatever? The, the bodice yeah. comes to a point. Comes down to a point like this, like that V look. I'm going to see about this. Okay, there you have some nuns teaching in a, in a school there. Goofy little things there, this V thing in the front of their forehead there. Pretty weird. And, of course, you know, the students have uniforms on as well. And there we have some more uniforms. And uh, you can see different men there in the... Even in the, the men there, they have these different types of suspenders and things like this and different collared suspenders. And it means different things according to what cult what branch of the cult that they're and, in. And, of course, let's not forget, the brim of their hat must be a certain standard. Uh-huh. Let's not forget that, okay? That is very important. Yep. Of course it's important. But let's continue. Not? See, again, here we have these four weird nuns. Again, you see that goofy thing there uh, on the left, that weird thing coming down in the middle of the head. Then you see one that's very similar to our sister, Mother Superior Catherine here. And uh, then you have this one here. This next one is kind of odd. And then this one here is like a sun disc or something behind her head. But again, you see the ones, you know, this one on the far left there has that same kind of a V-shaped angled bodice that comes down very much like Amish women wear. Interesting. That one is a gray nun on your left. A gray nun on the left. Yes, your okay. left. Audience so, right. Here's another picture of another nun. Or gray kind of nun. library. Another gray nun. And again, you see... Amish, very, very similar to the Catholics. Here you have a soft Amish style cap. And this is, what's that, the type that they would sell to tourists or whatever, not the mm -hmm. official one. An Old Order River Brethren cap. You know, again, you see this, this thing of a head covering. And there, of course, well, you can read the captions underneath them. But, you know, of course, I grew up around that type of thing there in Lancaster County. And I saw a lot of this. You know, it's funny, you know, they have there in the one in the middle, the traditionally the ties are made of the same fabric as the cap, but uh, some are sold with satin ties. Well, that's dangerous. You know, you're right on the brink of going worldly. You know, crazy. And again, see, it looks very much like the gray nun. Was he called a habit or something? I think so. Yeah, the gray nun habit. And the Augustinians, you know? too. And the Augustinians. I mean, it's it looks just like the Catholics. It's blue instead of black and white like this. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. How about that? You know, I don't even know what these people are. You know, some kind of Amish, just weird sect or something. Again, another Amish Mennonite type of dress. Very much like the Catholics. And here this woman's, oh, I'm sorry, it's not a woman. Oh, it's the Pope, Pope John Paul II. And uh, his little girlfriend there beside him wearing a dress as well. You know, you got to watch out when you got men walking around in robes and looking like they're in dresses, you know. Kind of odd. But here you have uh, three Buddhist, you know, female Buddhists. Yeah. That's a nice look, you know, shaving their heads and everything. Yeah, that, real attractive. But again, you see this thing of, you know, here you have these uh, Buddhist women, you know, doing these prayer things and stuff. More Buddhist women with uniforms, male Buddhists there, Buddhist monks, uniforms. And ironically, they're, the Buddhist monk uniform picture looks very similar to some of the fashionable trends of one shoulder sleeve, you know, one shoulder on, one shoulder off kind of style of shirts and dresses mm -hmm. that have been trendy throughout time. Yep. How about that? And here, of course, we have the mark of true holiness for women. You have the uh, black unmarried covering and the white married covering. So what do you have? I see black and white. What's that mean? That's contradiction. 
No, it's not. I am Mother Superior. Oh, Mother Superior. That's different then. Yes. Oh, okay, because you're married to Mystery Babylon, the whore. No. And you're unmarried in the sense I'm of being celibate. I'm married to the Pope. Well, that's not possible because the Pope's celibate. Only according to the laity, he's uh -huh. celibate. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry, he doesn't like you. He likes little boys. So, let's continue. Here you have Christian women's head coverings by sect. Oh, sure. Uh, you got Amish there, and then you have the Catholic nun, Catholic, Eastern Orthodox nun, Eastern Orthodox, Hutterite, Quaker, Mennonite. And, of course, you know, how ridiculous. I mean, again, which one is the right one? Which one is the most power? I mean, which one is the one that's defined in Scripture? You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I mean, you can watch my study on that, this whole thing of this Christian veiling thing. It's, it's nonsense. It's not in the Bible. You know, it's it's absolutely ridiculous. I guess maybe your head covering is holier than any of those there, right? Yes, because it's not patterned like that heterate one. Yeah, yours is more plain, so it's much better. Yes. <laughs> and it covers more because I have to cover my hair so nobody from the outside world sees what my hair looks like. After all, it's not pious if my hair shows. Mm-hmm. Sure. And again, you know, Where's this stuff at in Scripture? I know that there are Jews, you know, Orthodox Jews, that the women will cover their hair. Where? In Scripture. You say, well, it's a, a thing, it's a belief that we have. Where's it at in Scripture? Show it to me. It's and how there. does that make you, how does that head covering make you as a woman submissive to your husband? Yeah. How does a piece of cloth do that? Explain right? it. Yeah. Let's continue. Here we have more... Um, different Catholic women of the world. I mean, you can make them all Catholic. You got the Muslims, you got the nuns, you got the Amish, you got, you know, all these different things, you know, and, and it's just crazy. You know, see, it's the world religion. When it comes together, it's got little bits here and there of all these different cultures and everything else, all these women wearing head coverings and things, and it's all just going to merge. It's, it's merging. They're all daughters of the harlot. The Amish are daughters of the harlot. That's just the way it is. There you have Orthodox Jew on the left, and you have Catholic nun, Orthodox Christian nun, Muslim. See the similarities between the uniforms? And you can throw Amish in there. They fit right in. They're not Anabaptists. They're not, oh, they, they were the way that early Christians were. No, they're not. They're just Catholic is all that they are. There you have the classic Quaker bonnet. Again, the Quakers, another sect of Catholicism. More bald-headed female nuns, you know. Nice look. And again, look at this, you know. I mean, take the, the cross thing off of them. They're around their neck. These two Burmese. Burmese nuns. They look like Amish. They look like Mennonite. That's what they look like. Hair parted down the middle, too. That makes it really pious and holy. You know? Sure. Here we have Franciscan sisters. Again, they could pass for charity ministries, Mennonite, Amish, any of that stuff. They could pass for that. Where are these people getting this stuff from? They're not getting it from the Bible. You know? Hello to all my manstars. I mean, Roman Catholic sisters. Yeah. In varying uniforms. I like this one, though. This is the best. This is my favorite. I mean, you got to be holy to wear something like that on your head. I mean, check that out. That's really nice there. You know, just incredible. Again, we have, what is this? Amish Mennonite cape dress. You know? There you have the Quaker dress. Notice the V. Shaped bodice in the front. It's all the same thing, people. And, of course, Jewish women... Uh, there you have the same kind of a thing. You know, a lot of these Orthodox Jewish women, where's this stuff at in the Scripture? Where's it at in the Bible? You know, there again you have, uh, what is that, Mennonite, I guess? I think so. Yeah. <clears throat> Mennonite or even Amish. Now, uh, you say, what's this picture have to do with anything? A bunch of guys standing around skiing. Well, you see, one of them's not in his religious uniform. One of them is just in regular clothes. So he looks like a regular guy. So who's that? 
Well, Pope John Paul II. But you wouldn't know it because he's not in his dress. His little white robe. Can you pick him out? I know, I know. Which one? The one right there, looking like he's looking at some kind of a phone or yep. dark glasses with the all-black outfit and the red boots. Yep, that's the Pope. But you wouldn't know it because he has, he's not wearing his religious uniform. Interesting. Just to kind of illustrate the thing there. Again, you know, these different head coverings. Which one's the right one? See, that it's, that's the ridiculous nature of the whole thing. Beachy Amish, uh, Eastern Mennonite, you know, all this different stuff. It's nonsense. Ridiculous. Again, another dress there. Another plain Anglican, you know, Quaker, whatever kind of a dress. Ridiculous. Uh, Muslim head coverings explained, you know. There Kimar and Kador, Al, Amira, and Shayla, Nikab and Burka and Ninja. Oh, I'm sorry, don't say Ninja. And Hijab there. Amish, Nebraska pleaded. Amish Schwarzenegger, you know. Nebraska Amish pleaded, you know, all this nonsense. Old German Baptist Brethren, conservative Mennonite covering, uh, conservative Mennonite. Again, you see the V in the back. And it's kind of interesting, too. It's supposed to be modest. But yet, it that V in the back there kind of draws attention to a certain area. You know what I mean? It's part of a so-called you know. apron? Mm-hmm. Crazy. Again, another covering. Again, here we have the current Pope, Francis, and he's, you know, in this thing, uh, this picture here, and he's in the subway, and he's just got a regular priest outfit on, so nobody knows it's the Pope. I personally think this photo is staged. You know, I don't I don't think, you know, they're just, oh, nobody knows it's the Pope sitting there. Especially with the Masonic uh, hand yeah, sign little, there. Yeah. So, ridiculous. But again, you see this thing of a religious uniform. You take the religious uniform off, they look like anybody else. Another picture there of an om omelette woman, be she Mennonite, Amish, whatever, doesn't matter. They're pretty much all the same kind of deal. Again, you can see the V-shaped bodice there at the top, just like the nuns wear. Mm -hmm. There's a Pope coming through the subway again. You know, if you didn't know who he was, you'd just think he's some other Catholic priest. Again, see, see what a, putting a stupid uniform on will do for you? Again, Quaker bonnet. There's a lot of this stuff. I mean, we're just going to kind of zip through this. All these different head coverings and things and, and just just crazy. Uh, another, you know, thing of nuns there. And, and again, look at the bodice thing there. Very much like the Amish. You know, again, very similar to the Amish, the Augustinian nuns. You know, very similar with the apron going down the front. No, it's just crazy. Again, very similar. I mean, the one sitting up there on the fence, I mean, she, you know, either one, they look like Mennonite, you know, mm -hmm. and they're nuns. Just incredible. Taiwanese monks, you know, religious uniform, you know, religious uniforms here with these monks. You know, women's head coverings by different religions. You know, again, we saw some of those earlier, but, uh, you know, it just, it all goes back to the same thing of you're putting on an outward covering to cover up the filthiness of your flesh. And self-righteous religion can be summed up very simply. It is exaltation of the flesh. And you put on special robes and whatever else. That's what self-righteousness is all about. And that is why the Lord doesn't tell you in the Bible to wear certain uniforms. You say, well, what about the Levitical priesthood? We're going to get to that. We'll get to that. But you see, in the New Testament, there's a priesthood of believers. Now, there's the order of male over female in terms of in the setting of worship there, that the men are supposed to be the ones that are in charge and preaching and teaching the Word of God, and the women are to be in a submissive role. But that doesn't mean that women are somehow less than men. It's just a different uh, a different system, a different setup that they have, different purpose that they have. You know, women are to guide the house. That's not a lesser role. Okay. But to say, well, we're going to show these things by outward ordinances, outward coverings and things like this. I mean, it's just, 
That's not what the Lord intended. And you're going to have a real hard time trying to prove that from Scripture. Very, very, very hard time. Okay? Just a real, real problem. But uh, we're going to get continue with our study here. Of course, uh, I don't know about these head coverings there. You know, which one's better, theirs or yours? I'm not really sure. Well, of course mine is better. Why would you look at them and compare me to them? Are you trying to say that your head covering is better than mine? Yes. Can you believe this? Attitude over here? Her head covering is better than my head oh you, oh, you think so, do you? You think so. Okay. Okay. All right, fine. Yeah. Oh. Now, think? now who's better? Okay there, papist. What do you think about this? Oh, wait. Now she's got a, a military head covering on. I don't know. I don't know. Who would control things better, the, the papists or the military? You know, I guess the military is kind of subservient to the papists. Long live the Republic! Yeah. <laughs> All right, take that thing off. This thing here, I don't know. Keep us on for now. This is my fish hat, you know? They gone. See? Oh. Eat, 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 like that. Holy Father, Swiss cheese. <laughs> All right, let's continue here with our study. Uh, let's continue. Did God ever design a religious uniform for men? All right. Exodus chapter 28. Boy, people are going to be cutting this uh, picture of the two of us looking like this. They're going to say, see, I told you they were papists. You know? <laughs> Got the nun here and the priest here. Man, we're set. You know, this is great. But... Uh, Exodus chapter 28 verses 1 through 6. Let's let's see here about this thing of religious uniforms that God created. Okay. It says here, And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty, and thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garment, garments to con consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, and an ephod, and a robe, and a broidered coat, a mitre, and a girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. What am I reading to verse 6? And they shall take gold and blue and purple and scarlet, interesting collars there, and fine linen. And they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue, and of purple, and of scarlet, and fine twined linen with cunning work. Now you can read the rest of the chapter there. It gets into more of this thing of this, this religious uniform. But um, a couple things to notice here. First of all, Aaron was the high priest. And under Aaron were his sons serving him serving under his authority not they serve the lord but they served under his authority very interesting we're going to see about this in the new testament here as we continue but another interesting thing what were two of the collars there that the ephod contained purple and scarlet is there a certain religion that uses purple and scarlet as its primary collars uh, just, we'll have to think about that. We'll come back to that later. Mm -hmm. Sure we will. Um, turn next in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Who is our high priest? Jesus Christ. Hmm. You say, well, Brian, I thought that's the book of Hebrews is for the time of Jacob's troubled saints. Yes, it is, definitely, and he will definitely be their high priest. But it's even more so true for us today. Okay, It lines up perfectly with, with what you read over there in the Pauline epistles in terms of, you know, we are members of the body of Christ, and, you know, he is the mediator between God and men. You know, so it's there. So again, we have Jesus Christ as our high priest in heaven but where does it say that we're supposed to have a religious uniform see it doesn't 
First John chapter two. Turn next to First John chapter two. First John chapter two verses one and two. It says here, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, he died. His blood is available to anyone. Okay, there is no predestinated elect that's pre-chosen before the foundation of the world. And if you're not one of the pre-chosen elect, then you can't get saved and you know, all this stuff. And you're forced into salvation through his unconditional election. That stuff is nonsense. Okay, that's you know that was made by a pope of you know a non-Catholic pope, a Calvinist pope, John Calvin. Okay, a Protestant pope. Okay, there's Catholic popes. There's Protestant popes. Okay, Protestant popes are just Catholic of another name. It's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, beer and, and light beer. Still beer. But um, you see it there again, this thing of Jesus Christ being kind of the mediator between us. I'm getting ahead of myself, actually, because 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 is where we're, we're going to go next. You know your Bible. I already kind of quoted this verse. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So there again you see it. And it lines up with books that I believe are dispensationally pointed at people in the future. But you see this thing again here of Jesus Christ being, you know, the mediator between God and men. So how are we to be clothed? In uh, PhD robes and Mother Superior outfits? Let's see about that. Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. Now there are definitely t scriptural teachings and things for women and modest apparel, uh, and and men should be wearing modest apparel too, not you know causing women to lust, uh, and nowadays men too, ugh, you know, <laughs> sodomites. But the point is, you know, I'm going to be doing a study on that in the future too, the thing of modest apparel for men. But we're supposed to be clothed also in a different way in terms of as Christians. Let's look about that. Philippians chapter three verse nine. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. You know, dealing with these Hutterites that have come onto my channel with this hellish Hutterite study, they're all talking about, you know, uh, you know, you're, you don't have love and you don't, you don't, you know, you're too mean and everything to be a real Christian. They never quote scripture. And when they talk about the Bible, they'll say the KGV or the KVJ or something. They don't even know how to say King James Version or King James Bible. They don't quote scripture. What are they? They have their own righteousness. They're self-righteous people. They don't have the righteousness which is of faith in Christ Jesus there. Next, let's go to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 through 8. It says here, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Now what is that fine linen? For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Now you are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, but that doesn't mean that you just can get away with murder down here. That, just, that doesn't mean that you can live an unrighteous life, that you should not be separate from the world. That is still there. Part of your life as a Christian is sanctification, getting rid of evil things and stuff and not going out into the world and causing people to, to blaspheme the name of the Lord or blaspheme his word because of your wickedness. You're not supposed to live as a hypocrite, Christian. There is supposed to be a difference between you and the world. That's very important. So that fine linen there comes as a result of that righteousness of Jesus Christ that you reflect with your life. It doesn't mean that you go around wearing something like this or something like that. Okay, that doesn't. That's not going to help you. Okay, the people that wear this kind of junk are the most wicked people out there. You know, 
Definitely. And you see some Amish people in your area. Don't think for one second that they're righteous and holy people. If you've seen the, the, I think it was what, part one, I think, the thing of the Amish deception, you know, and uh, the book Amish Deception, um, you can see that the Amish live very, very wickedly. Uh, they are fornicators. They are child abusers. They are child molesters many times. And again, you know, you say, all of them, I know Amish and they're not bad and stuff. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are Catholics that are nice people too, okay? I'm not saying that every Catholic out there is a, is a child molester or whatever. But the system, the way the system is set up, it makes child molesters. You force a man into celibacy, and then you put him in a, in a booth with women, married women, and he's forced to say, I need to know every detail of your sexual life or whatever. Okay? It's, 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 it's guaranteed to fail. And you put Amish into religious uniforms where outwardly they can appear righteous to men, but inwardly they're full of dead men's bones and rottenness and iniquity. Your righteousness cannot come from what you wear. And by the way, let me just say this to the independent fundamental Catholics out there. You putting a suit and tie on and walking around and being holy, that might deceive some people into thinking that you're a good guy, but inwardly you got a pornography addiction or you got some other kind of problem. And I've been around independent, independent fundamental Catholics, and I know that a lot of these guys, and I say Catholic, combining Baptist and Catholic, if you don't know my our sense of humor, but I've seen Baptists... Pornography is a big problem with them. You know, it's oftentimes a very big problem with them. But boy, you put that suit and tie on, and that wife puts on the nice, modest dress, you know, oh, and they're holy. And I've, I mean, I've been around Baptists that will wear, they will not wear anything but a black suit with a white shirt and a black tie. Anything else is blasphemy. I know Baptists that will not wear blue jeans. Chapter and verse on that course not but they have all these standards and ironically the same thing happened to me that you just described i went into the uh, first lutheran cult <clears throat> i mean first lutheran church of boston in 2011 on a few occasions and the last sunday i attended which was fourth of july weekend of that year i came in in shorts and a t-shirt and running shoes or sneakers, so to speak, because that's all I didn't have packed at the time. Everything else in line was packed away in my car because I was leaving, you know, to get away from Massachusetts after the cult services had ended that day. And boy, you talk about just looks of horror and, and ghastly, you know, fear that I would appear in anything other than a, you know, uniform. <clears throat> I mean, modest. Sunday best dress. Yes. Sunday yes, best. Sunday best. It's in the Bible someplace. I, was I don't remember down. the verse, but it's there somewhere. Yes. Yeah. Crazy. People did not even speak to me. They just looked at me in horror. Well, that's a good thing to, to put people down because of the way they're dressed. Yes. <laughs> you should have had your sister Catherine outfit. You would have fit in at, I, a, you at a Lutheran cult. It's terrible, isn't it? It is. All right. Next, we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, going to read verses 1 through 11. Okay. It says here, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven, if so be that being clothed with, we shall not be found naked. That's very important there. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Interesting. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether we, present or absent we may be accepted of him. Keep that in mind. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every one may receive the things done in his body whether, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. 
Now, there's a whole lot in that, okay? Uh, very interesting there. But I want you to notice two things. First of all, in verse 3, it says, if so, being, if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. What on earth is this talking about? I mean, what what's going on here? Is this talking we should have some kind of religious uniform? Well, ironically, yes. Our religious uniform should actually be our life as Christians. It should not be an outward adorning, this kind of junk here. It should be the righteousness that we reflect from Jesus Christ. It's kind of interesting because if you study it, I remember hearing Brian Donovan uh, down at uh, Pensacola there, uh, Dr. Ruckman's church, and Brian Donovan did a study the one time on the moon as the church and Jesus Christ as the Son, okay, as you went. He's the Son of God, but he's also the Son of God. Interesting. The moon does not give off its own light. It has no ability to give off its own light. But it reflects the light from the sun. We don't have our own self-righteousness as Christians, but we can re reflect the righteousness of Jesus Christ through our lives. Okay? And that this body that we have, this flesh, is corruptible. It doesn't matter how much you pretty it up, how much you try to make it look righteous. It doesn't work. Our righteousness needs to come from Jesus Christ, the way we live. Okay? That's very, very important. And while in this body, you will groan. You will say, oh, man, I got a headache again or, or you know, I feel sick or whatever else. That's not going to happen when we get up there to heaven. The temptations to sin that you have all the time down here in this life, done when we get to be with the Lord. Talk about looking forward to that, you know. Very, very good. But what's this warning here? If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Very interesting there. And if you go down to uh, verse, uh, I guess it's verse 9, Wherefore we labor... What's the laboring about? That whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. And it talks about the judgment seat of Christ and, the, and knowing the terror of the Lord. I mean, remember, keep this in mind, that we are dealing with a God that doesn't make mistakes. I mean, I can have grace for you. You can have grace for me because we make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time in these videos, you know. I mean, we we both we laugh at each other a lot because we're we're very clumsy in things, and, and you know we'll trip over our own shadow sometimes. God doesn't do that. God knows every intent of the heart. He knows every thought, every secret thing. And to say, well, you're a Christian, you you believe that you have eternal security, so that's a wimpy kind of a thing, and and you you think you're going to get away with murder and whatever. Oh, no, 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 no. We don't believe that way. Believing in eternal security means I am secure. We are secure as Christians. We're going to be in heaven someday. Not because of this, not because of outward righteousness, but because of what Jesus Christ did for us and the fact that we've put our faith in that and come to him in a broken, repentant state as well. We aren't prideful. We aren't saying, I have a PhD and I have this and I have that. We're, we're good people. No, 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 no. But understanding that we are going to one day have to give an account for the life that we've lived. That's the terror of the Lord that comes into this whole thing. And if we live like the world, if we are clothed with the world's standards, and if we do things like the world and we look like the world and act like the world and everything else, and you're truly saved and you get worldly like that, there's a danger that you're going to show up naked at the judgment seat of Christ. You say, oh, come on, this is ridiculous. Turn to Revelation chapter 3. You say, if I'm a little bit worldly, come on, I'm not going to show up in heaven without anything on. Well, I wouldn't be so sure of that. You see, there is a uniform that you're going to have in heaven. And there's a danger of you not having much of a uniform. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 through 22. This is a great warning here, a great admonition for the end times. And I do believe that the seven churches in the uh, first part of Revelation here, I do believe that they uh, give instruction in righteousness for the church age. And we are in the Laodicean time period here. Now, I know that there's doctrinal things that you can go back and forth and whatever else, but all Scripture is given uh, by inspiration of God and is profitable for um, doctrine, for reproof, for 
Oh. Rebuke. No, correction for instruction in righteousness. Okay? So there's instruction in righteousness that you can use for Scripture. Let's read here. Verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked? Huh? Wait a second. They're rich, yet they're naked. Hmm. Did you know that you can have a lot of earthly possessions and yet have no real righteousness? Not really reflecting the righteousness of Jesus Christ? I mean, your Savior was a homeless Jew. Something to think about. Verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Check that one out. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door... I will come in to him, and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Boy, there's some interesting things there. Verse 21 is something that you really need to think about. Okay, To him that overcometh, Will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne? You know, sometimes it gets rather vexing living in this time period. Very vexing, you know. Um, but yet, how much greater rewards are we going to get because of getting through this time and reflecting the righteousness of Jesus Christ through this, this time period? Be encouraged. If you are a Bible-believing Christian and you're watching these videos, and you're studying and things, and witnessing to people, and you got people mad at you, and, you know, if you saw last week's study, the thing about your responsibility to your family and things, and you have family problems and stuff like that, be encouraged. You're on the right track. I know it's not easy sometimes. I know it's difficult, but uh, keep at it. You will be rewarded for that someday. But verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. What is that? What is gold tried in the fire? Well, you can make it into a lot of things, but I believe that it is the righteousness of God. That gold tried in the fire. You're reflecting God's righteousness. Gold is often associated with God, with the throne room and with heaven and things. You're reflecting God's righteousness. And white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Wouldn't it be something for a a uh, kind of worldly Christian, one that's actually saved, you know, that, but just messes around in the world and doesn't really ever do anything for the Lord, wouldn't it be something to get there to heaven and you got this little loincloth on instead of having more righteousness than that? I heard a theory the one time that when you get saved, it's like you start to actually make your clothing. Those holy standards that, that the Bible tells you to live by, and you live by those, and you don't worry about what people say about you, you're knitting those clothes. And the more things you give up here on the earth, the more you live for the Lord, the more you read His Word, the more you pray, the more you witness, the more you do for the Lord, the more clothing you're going to be wearing when you get to the judgment seat of Christ. How would you like to show up naked in front of all the host of heaven? The shame of thy nakedness. Hmm. And how about this? Anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. You know, there's a lot of people, it's like they're looking at a different world than we are as Bible-believing Christians. They'll talk about, you know, where the church is going to be in another 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you know, and just like you say, are we living in the last days? Oh, I don't know. Some people could say we are. So I, I don't know. I don't really know for sure. <laughs> and I'm going, you don't know that we're living in the last days? What in the world, you know? What kind of, I mean, what are you looking at here? You know, what's going on? Their eyes are blinded. 
That's why you have a lot of these modern Laodiceans. I don't even believe that they're saved. Okay? I believe that they're foreign matter in the stomach of God. They appear that they're in the body of Christ. They know the right things to say. But at the rapture, the catching away, they're going to be like vomited out. Hmm. And uh, when you actually do see the world for what it really is, you know what it causes? Repentance. You look at this world and you say, man, there's, there's not a chance. This world doesn't have a chance. I have no chance being down here and fitting into this mess and everything else. Man, I got to get saved. And you'll do whatever. You won't rely on uh, religious uniforms like this or like that. <laughs> In spite of how nice and smiley my uh, mother superior here looks. So, but uh, just want to do this study real quickly. And uh, I got to get this thing off my head. I probably have like a red, do I have a red line on my forehead now? Yes. Yeah. This thing's tight on my head. I bought this thing for, I was going to do a Dr. Smarty Pants video with this and, and uh, haven't gotten around to it yet. So I thought I'd wear it for this study, but it's, you know. They say, one size fits all. Yeah, well, not when you have a huge head like mine. You know, I got the thing adjusted totally out, you know, and it's like still too tight for my head, <laughs> my giant head. Ugh. But, uh, hope you like our, our little sense of humor here thing today. We got to bring this study to a close because this disgusting polyester gown here is just like about dying. It. Yeah, you know, we, we don't wear a polyester we wear natural fibers cotton wool that type of thing non-blended right and uh maybe we'll do a study on that sometime too but um the benefits of wearing natural clothing rather than synthetic fibers but again you know even that i mean we we talked about this uh, i think one of the studies i think i mentioned it that the amish women are not well amish in general are not aware allowed to wear cotton uh, that has to be polyester because polyester doesn't wrinkle so you know mm -hmm. Oh, brother. And they cannot yeah. wear patterns. It yeah. has to be plain. Yeah. Like this. Yes, very nice and plain. I mean, I'm sure you're all very impressed, and you're probably going to convert to Catholicism now. Yes. Because you've actually seen a real mother superior talking to you. Especially it's... when they have their hair part of the middle, because that makes it easier to get into heaven. <laughs> and after all, you don't want any problems now, do you? No. So we will, we will conclude this study here and uh, look out for religious uniforms, brethren. Uh, don't be impressed. Don't be wild. Don't, don't think to yourself, oh, there's some holy people there uh, that are wearing these religious uniforms. Uh, they're not. And don't fall into the trap either of wearing the suit and tie thing and the dress and, and starting to think that your righteousness comes from that outward adorning. It doesn't. Uh, you can put a you can put a tramp into a dress and she's still a tramp. You can put a, a thief into a suit and tie. He's still a thief. In fact, he's dangerous, more dangerous now because now he can con you better because he's in a religious uniform. Okay, so uh, I guess we'll conclude this study and um, we'll see if maybe there will be more appearances of uh, Sister Catherine here and maybe some more Dr. Smarty Pants stuff coming out in the future too. We'll see. Um, because, you know, it's it's good to have a laugh once in a while. And that's what this whole thing has been about. So uh, watch out for religious uniforms. Don't fall for it, brethren. Okay? So that will be it. And uh, we thank you very much for watching. And we will see you in the next video.